All right. How many of you do DevOps or know what DevOps is? That's a few, few fewer hands. Sam CJ, the same person I was yesterday. That's boring. All right, let's. I'm going to take a bit, little bit of a recap of the registry's history, and it's going to be completely from a DevOps perspective, which means where node hits production and what we had to do to scale to meet the needs of that exponential curve I showed you all yesterday. And I got to spend most of the time talking about our stack right now because I love it when other people talk about their stacks. I want to know what's working for you, what you like using, what is completely flaky and falls over and that you hate because that helps me make decisions about the technology I choose to use in production. So I'm telling you all my secrets, all the registries secret so that you can have some information and share it as well. So we started as this app embedded in CouchDB. It was JavaScript, but it wasn't Node. This is like a sort of an embarrassing thing for me for a long time. NPM, Node's big registry, used almost no Node whatsoever. Um, and what's more, it was a really pretty horrible, tangled piece of JavaScript. It was very difficult to work on. In order to work on it, you had to have Isaac sit you down and explain to you for a long time what it did, what the various side effects were, what it did when it came in with a registry.mpmjs.org header versus what it did when you didn't have that header, admin mode versus normal user mode. It just wasn't, it wasn't nice. There were some advantages though. If you remember from my speech yesterday, it was a simple working system. The registry worked. CouchDB has really excellent replication. If you wanted to make a mirror, it was easy. If you want to make a mirror of the NPM public data today, all you have to do is spin up CouchDB, point it at our public rec replication point, and half an hour later, you'll have the full registry. This is pretty awesome. Didn't have to implement off. We got couches off. We got away with storing package tarballs in Couch. And it worked for a longer time than any of the people who wrote that first system deserved. <laughs> I say this as, as someone who inherited it. <laughs> um, disadvantages, all of it, all of it fell over at scale, which happened in the fall of 2013. Um, tarballs fell over first. Base 64 encoded binary blobs that you had to decode every time. And there wasn't a cache in front of it. So Couch did that work every time anybody installed anything. Like, of course it fell over. Um, and figuring out what was going on in Couch, it was possible for people who were Erlang experts and who could debug Couch, but that wasn't us. Non-modular code base, hard to work on, tangled legacy code. So in late 2013, the registry had a challenge, which was stay up. It was like the source of lots of jokes. Um, first thing Isaac did at the time, because it was pretty much one man's side project, he pulled tarballs out into Joint's Manta object store. This was pretty good. Couch had to do a lot less work. Put varnish in front of everything. A cache, yay! A cache in front of the most cacheable data there, there is because tarballs don't change. This is just something you should never have to read twice. Um, and we put every, it, Fastly actually provides varnish for us. Fastly also is a, is a worldwide content delivery network so that European package installs suddenly got a lot faster also for Australia. So that was pretty good. We stopped really falling over daily. And in early 2014 is when the company was founded. They hired people like me to come in and turn their operations into something more stable. Node 2014 was the, no the year of Node's explosion. Node 10 was pretty much the constant stable base for Node the whole time. And people just used it like crazy on top of something that was working. I put the tarballs under file system. That made it even faster and cheaper. We methodically figured out how TouchDB worked, how to figure out when it was going wrong, and we started fixing problems with our setup. Load balanced everything so that we had more than one of everything, and if one thing fell over, we had three more. It was fine. 
operational maturity, by which I mean monitoring existed and Twitter didn't tell us when we were down anymore. <laughs> yeah, that was awful. <laughs> The big sign of our success at about this time last year was that mirrors started shutting down. And that meant we were doing it right because people didn't feel the need to mirror us anymore. They didn't feel the need to mirror us for speed and they didn't feel the need to mirror us for stability. And that I took as like re really a great moment, European mirror shut down because you didn't need it anymore. Excellent. So we're stable. We've got this company, we've got VC money. Wouldn't it be great if we were self-sustaining? Uh, the downside of that much of all the node package installing you all are doing is that bandwidth costs are they're not tiny. <laughs> um, I, I, so it would be great to have some money coming in to make this registry self-sustaining so that we don't have to keep begging for money from VCs to keep going or we don't have to get bought by something we don't trust. So to do that, we have to have enough flexibility to add features to the registry that people would want to pay for. So a little bit later than this last year, we started a rewrite. A rewriting in Node because, hey, we are Node experts. We don't know much about Erlang, but we know about this Node thing. We, went, we chose microservices, which have a bunch of advantages in our Node's natural architecture. We started thinking about how, what the future scaling needs are. It's great to be meeting today's demand, but when you've got an exponential curve staring you in your face, you, th you have to think about what it's gonna look like six months from now or a year from now. So we had to think about future scaling. In fact, I'm thinking about future scaling today, even with the current architecture. It's not gonna last forever. And we wanted to add features. Specifically, the feature we wanted to add that we thought people would really like was scoped modules. So here's what a scoped module is. We've got HyperFS, the famous module published yesterday, or the day before. Um, and that's great. But Michael wants to fork it. And he still wants to call it HyperFS, but maybe he's like a super hip ZFS based HyperFS. So he gets to publish it under his namespace of his NPM username. I, meanwhile, have something called HyperFS that I use completely privately for my, you know, super secret startup. My completely unrelated private module can be called SiegeBot HyperFS, and you install it the same way you install everything else. NPM install SiegeBot slash HyperFS, and you get that. Every one of you, if you have an NPM account, you can publish scoped modules today, publicly. Pay us seven bucks a month, you can make them private. So we wanted to do that. And this is what the team looked like. Three engineers doing registry and operations. That included me, I was mostly operations through all of that time. Two engineers working on our website, two engineers working on our command line client. Command line client is in the middle of its own pretty massive rewrite right now. It'll make your lives a lot nicer, I think, when it hits. Maybe next month, maybe. We finished that late last year and shipped the core of it as NPM Enterprise. You know, this is sort of the GitHub model. Like, you can give us a small amount of money and get private stuff that we host, or you can give us a lot of money and we'll give you a box that you put inside your own infrastructure because you don't want your code to get outside your walls because you're a financial institution or something like that. That's our other way to make money. The really great thing about making NPM Enterprise is that we had a working registry in Node long before we had to put production traffic through it. We stomped, stomped all the big bugs while making this, but long before we even considered moving the main registry over to it. And we did that and a bunch of additional work through the winter and spring of this year. We had it in production in April. Uh, this was in production and no one noticed it. Occasionally I would say smart ass things on Twitter about it being in production. Uh, <laughs> And then we, 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 when we made scope modules live, it was just a feature flip. We pushed new config out, boom, they were live. Actually, it wasn't even that. I think it was a timer, like, and it's time to coincide with a press release. That was, pretty, that was pretty great, because that was the most low stress release moment I've ever been, lived through. It literally happened while I was still asleep. That was great. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the details. You ready? Yeah, okay. 
you got to share your details with me too someday, okay? I want you up here doing a talk like this. Here's our stack at the top level. Fastly, talked about that. Amazon, we're on Amazon, everybody uses it, it's cheap. No customer support to speak of, but you get lots of control. We do not use any EBS or any other Amazon specific text. I could migrate to another cloud provider if I wanted to. I could migrate to bare hardware if I wanted to. That would be nicely cheap. Um, Ubuntu Trusty, the least annoying of the Linux distros. <laughs> yeah. and that Trusty is our long-term support release. Nagios, oh, I hate Nagios, but it works. PagerDuty, PagerDuty might go off in my pocket right now, but it's not going to. GitHub hosts our code, both public and private. And we use Travis for all our CI. Middle of the stack. Let's go down a little. We use Hot Proxy a lot, and we're using Hot Proxy more and more. Um, both at like facing the outside world, terminating TLS to the outside world, and internally to do load balancing for applications. It's uh, we like. There's a really nice mo node module for like mangling the uh, config file on the fly that we use pretty heavily, which is nice because it lets us do our deployments. We have some instances of pound around terminating TLS, kind of trying to phase that out. Pound is impossible to observe, so I never know what it's doing or why it's suddenly melting down. <laughs> Nginx, love it. Serve all the hard balls through Nginx, any static file. Another workhorse of the modern web. And speaking of workhorses, Redis. Everybody loves Redis. <laughs> we still use CouchDB, and we will probably use, be using CouchDB at the heart of the registry for the, the entire rest of the time it exists, in part because we have this contract with everybody who mirrors us that we will continue providing this particular API for replication. And Couch is really good at that. It's very good arbitrary JSON document store, and it, replication is easy. But what Couch is terrible at, I mean beyond terrible, is ad hoc querying. It's a key value store. If you're not getting at its data through its main key, you are in for pain. So we've introduced Postgres. We started, um, we have our users billing access control lists. All our new data goes into Postgres. And this is, this is sort of the most fun. We have a replica of the package data in Postgres that drives the website. So the website can do queries on like who depends on what. What are your dev dependencies? What are your normal dependencies? You wrote what author? What other packages did this author write? Eventually, I want to make all that data available to you all through a public API, but I have to make it a little bit more robust first. Big node modules. Websites and happy. Everything else uses node restify. Do you know node restify? How many of you people? Yeah. We use Connects to help with Postgres. We don't use any ORMs. There was a sort of a minor war inside the company when somebody proposed using an ORM. The, the anti-ORM side won, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> not, to, not that I have any opinions. Um, <laughs> Restify, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Restify right now. This is, this is just awesome piece of code. It's really very solid, stable, performs really well. It's barely a framework, it's really tiny. It's really trivial to get a JSON API running with it. I mean, you'll, you'll, you can have one inside five minutes. It's observable. If you're into D-Trace, it's very D-Traceable. It uses Sinatra Express style routing, so if you, you know how that works, you know how Restify works. And all the connect, pretty much all the connect middleware works with it if you want that. And I like that style. Uh, yeah, we we didn't we didn't do anything like build a framework on top of Restify or anything like that. That's like what PayPal did with Kraken. They observed that they had all these conventions across services, and then they codified them in a framework that you use to, to write your services with that. We've instead chosen to make lots of little modules that we then compose into services, usually routinely. Like all of our monitoring endpoints are provided by a module. Like we can have a simple ping, very cheap status endpoint 
endpoint that all of our, our deploy scripts use, a more expensive status endpoint that tells you what your PID is and how, what your memory usage is, how long you've been up, and then a really expensive endpoint that like does a deep check of health. But now, all those are the same across all the services. Every service has a REPL. REPLs are great for debugging in production. You know about REPLs? You know you can put a REPL on anything? It's awesome. Log everything in JSON. Config is mostly through command line arguments. The, uh, my colleague Ben inherited Optimist, which became Yargs. And so he's maintaining Yargs, so we use Yargs for everything for our command line options. And some in very, very valuable passing. Nothing particularly interesting. This was interesting. A late innovation that I haven't fully integrated all the way. We're still using it in this kind of kludgy way. We haven't, like, we're not really using the database for configuration. We put our config in the database, and then we inspect it in the database, but we aren't yet pulling it directly from it. But that, that'll happen. We're staging that out. Um, we wrote a little tool to store a, take a JSON service config file, store it recursively inside etcd. You can edit individual keys in it and then pull it out. This is pretty handy. I like etcd. I'm going to be using it more heavily. Ansible. How many of you use config automation? Like when you spin up a new server, use Chef, Puppet, Salt. That is not enough hands. <laughs> Don't hand roll your servers. No special snowflakes. How will you replace them? Especially if you're using a, like Amazon, where Amazon's like, hi, I don't like that instance anymore. Bang, it's gone, you've got no warning. How do you replace that? Are you gonna like do this like thing where you spin it up SSH into it and type like apt get install yourself? No. Use Ansible or something like it, Chef Puppet, no special snowflake servers. Anything can be replaced simply by running a script with no human intervention. All right. I don't know how interesting these are. This is sort of the, the logical registry topology. It's not very exciting. Front door proxies, all those proxies I talked about yesterday. Search is separated out. We did that two weeks ago. We observed, hey, search is making couch fall over. We didn't know that before. We, we, we literally split it, use the proxy technique to split it out onto its own boxes because, hey, let's just take search and shove it over there. And then we realized, wait, it's making our biggest box fall over. Wait, all the other couches are very bored now. Oh, it turns out search was most of our couch load. Oh, that was good to know. Um, each of these pieces is a scalable unit here. Every one of those is something I can have N of. And I can do things like this. Couple of single points of failure, you'll notice. Right primaries are still single points of failure. But I just replicated most of my infrastructure redundantly across two data centers. It means if East goes out, none of you will notice. We had West go out, sort of chunk of West lose networking a couple months ago. The registry just kept working. It was beautiful. And here's the John freaking Madden diagram. This is what is actually in production right now, um, which, is, which is a complexity at a level that I normally don't have to think about. I made myself make this diagram because I thought, okay, it's, it, it, while we were in the middle of deploying new services, I thought it would be really great if I actually had a single diagram with everything on it so I could explain to my boss what we had just you know, spent the money on. And so that's, that's it, that's, that's the whole thing. And that's over-provisioned beyond words. I think that'll get us through another six months of you all installing packages like, whoa. Um, and it's not everything either. We have a staging environment. I'm not showing on this. Lots of complexity. Each piece has well-defined responsibility. Each piece, it can be made redundant. There is at least four of everything. Exceptions of the DB write primaries. Every service can be worked on by an engineer in isolation. You don't have to share a code base with anybody most of the time. Downsides. 
I really like David's talk about distributed about microservices earlier today. Um, the talk about what he was saying about like how it's organic and non-deterministic, and you have emergent properties. I think this is true. This is something you have to cope with when you start dis distributing lots of services. Back pressure in one place can cascade through everything. Did you think about how you're handling back pressure? You probably won't really think about it until you have this deployed. Pretty sure our message queue is in our feature. Let's, let's move it to distributed. Instead of naive distributed systems, we're probably going to move to distributed systems too. Slightly less naive Boogaloo. We have some single points of failure. We actually rehearse replacing these. Sometimes we replace them without needing to, just so that we have fresh in our minds how to do it. Because it would be a disaster if we didn't know how to replace them and Amazon just went, Poof. say goodbye to your instance one morning, as Amazon is wont to do. We rehearse restoring from backup, too, for the same reason. This is what I call operational maturity. I'm sure I'll mess something up at some point. Oh man, our metrics are terrible. Our logs are terrible. Gigabytes of logs sitting on disk that I'm not processing at all. Everything is hand-rolled. I hate that too. Yeah, that's so sad. We, tried, we tested everything on the new registry with IOJS, but at the time we were testing it, it still had some pretty nasty memory leaks that we observed almost immediately. And some networking trouble that we haven't yet verified is gone. Um, if I get some free time next week, I'm going to try again with IOJS 1.8. I really hope. I really want us to be like on the latest. And now, you know, that has Node. I need, I'll be on you know, Node 2 eventually. But the, the need to stay up and to not, and to keep serving those packages kind of out, really beat out my desire to be on the dual cool hotness. All right. This was, when I talk about hand rolled stuff, git deploy, deployment appears to be the thing that like everybody has trouble with. Like it's like, people talk about it, they give constant talks at it, about, about it at conferences. Everyone, it sucks for everybody. Nobody has a good solution. So this was a pain for us. We were deploying with Ansible. Don't do that. That was not fun. Um, until we wrote a bunch of tools that let us just git push. And git push does a bunch of work on a whole bunch of services via orchestration and then it reports in Slack. Most of this is open sourced. So we just run hop proxy in every box. We run a webhook server in every box. GitHub webhooks trigger the webhook server. It runs a bash script. Yay, bash. And then the bash script just pulls, reinstalls, builds, and then restarts. Because we do everything in Ansible, it means everything has to be happened unattended. So we wrote a tool to set up GitHub web, webhooks for any repository. And then a server that listens for the webhook pushes and then runs scripts in response to like pattern match rules. I, Isaac likes to pronounce GitHub as Jathub. <laughs> So I named, I named these modules that to troll him. Um, <laughs> and we have Roller Derby, which does rolling restarts for servers behind Hot Proxy. The great thing, we don't do it, we actually don't do any orchestration. We do this like completely naive thing. We're like, okay, roll. We've got four processes on this box. Roll, roll them one at a time, wait for the monitoring to come back. And if monitoring doesn't come back, fail and yell. So that you know, no, no deploy can ever truly fail. And it just does this on all of the boxes at once without any regard to doing it in sync. And it just re everything reports back into Slack when it's done. And then we have the Rend tool I mentioned. Uh, these slides will be online. There are links to all of this. We generate upstart or whatever. Send some, some of our enterprise customers use CentOS, so we can generate whatever the heck CentOS uses. I wrote a bunch of stuff for our metrics, which I'm not very happy with, but this is open sourced as well. It's a tiny little client you can stick into any node service, uh, collector service that you run on the same box, dump metrics to the collector, the collector can spit them out and spit them out to logs, spit them out to graphite, spit them out to influx. 
I'm about to add a couple others to that as we're experimenting with it. I don't like it. We can overwhelm influx really easily with the amount of data we have. So I'm looking for another time series database. Probably going to be graphite. I overwhelm influx because these are the, what the numbers look like. As of last week when I got on a plane. 150,000 modules. Probably going to cross 200,000 modules in November. 400 gigabytes of tarballs growing every day. 68 million downloads a day, 5,800 requests per second, peak, peak time. We, can, uh, we know when you all are working. I've got this graph that says, ah, Europe's awake. You know, east coast of the US is awake, west coast is awake, peak falls, Japan wakes up. Um, and you, none of you work on weekends, I know that too. <laughs> All right, it's not all great. Some of it really pretty much, we know what we have to do next. You all want organizations. We heard that immediately. Private modules, yeah, great, but why can't I have my company have one organization with a whole bunch of accounts under it? It's already in progress. We shipped what we had to see whether you liked it or not. So this is what we're working on right now. I, this is another one I hear a lot, yes. <laughs> I, I, got, I had a lunch with uh, Mathintosh and Michael and they gave me some really great ideas for how the social graph, the NPM's lurking social graph inside package JSON can help make a lot, recommendations and waiting a lot better. I might, I'm stuck in Oslo for two days because my plane flight got canceled, so I may spend the next two days hacking on that, we'll see. So, because this is terrible. This is, this is my, the, my pet project as well. I think the rela relational package data should be available as an API for you all to query at will. So like every, every module author wants to know, who's depending on me? Right? If, you're, if, you're the, if you're Gulp or Grunt, you want to know who's, who's using me in their dev depths. Um, and I would like to answer those questions really easily for you. And I'd like to give you ways to like follow that chain down. But right, I have all that data. But if I let you query it, the database would just fall over because there's no caching. No, it's not really built out well yet. You can tell I can, I'm actually thinking much more as an operational person than as a node person right now. This is what this job has done to me. <laughs> yeah, we, right now um, public scoped modules are not available in the public replication point for legacy compatibility reasons. We would break a lot of um, downstream mirrors if we suddenly gave them scoped packages. So we have to make another public replication point available. That is what I got. Make sure you update your client, please. It's so much faster and so many fewer race conditions. Shall I, shall I take questions? Is Substack ready or should I vamp? Uh, I think does we have <laughs> questions? Right? Go, go for it. Um, how come, sorry, this is powerful. How come the, the downloads on the the listings page mm -hmm. are different from the downloads on the actual model page. My bug. So the list, the, the, the search listings page come from Elasticsearch, which is essentially a cache of the package data that gets like there's a follower couch. Like any time a module changes, we snag the latest download things, build up a. Um, build up a, just what you need to support stash search and then throw it into Elasticsearch. And so there are a whole bunch of pages that are built from that data, which is not the right data. That's on my list. That may even be, Raquel might be fin working on that right now, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know all about it. I know how to fix it. The fix should, should happen in the next week or so. so my apologies. Everyone wants their downloads data to be updated too. Yeah. You all know you all want to know downloads and dependencies. The spinning correct dude. You know the little uh, spinner. The spinner, yes. <laughs> I turned that off and went back to the HTTP status because I'm just so old fashioned. Um, so Yes, we're going to give you something better. Um, in progress right now, very close to being finished, is NPM 3.0, the NPM command line client 3.0. This completely rewrites how package installation works. Two big things. 
it will, it first makes a big, it goes through all the packages you're going to install and makes a list of the total work that it has to do. So it knows how many packages it has to install and it knows about how much time has elapsed thus far. You're going to get a real progress bar that goes across the screen and is more or less accurate. The other thing it's going to do is really flatten out the node modules hierarchy um, so that it, if if package A depends on package B at version 1 and package C also depends on package B at version 1, you will get package B at the top level by default. In other words, sort of what dedupe does now, only a better job of it. And this is also going to help if you're on Windows and if you've dealt with a long path problem. This will help you a lot there because all of the node modules is about to get a lot shallower. Um, so we're going to give you a progress bar. It's going to be a heck of a lot better. And you can turn the config off. You can turn the spinner off. NPM config set spinner something zero. I forget what. <laughs> Any more questions? Just follow up. Amazing. My pleasure. I was a huge fan of NPM before I started working on it. Now I know where all the bodies are buried, and you know it's still pretty good. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. <laughs>